Uh, yeah, uh, so this is uh, gene and cell therapies for meta neurometabolic diseases. Uh, we'll hear about three uh, clinical trials and some important preclinical research uh, covering topics of OTC deficiency, MPS 3A and 3B, and Rett syndrome. Uh, the first speaker is Kerry Harding. Um, update on phase one, two clinical trial for OTC deficiency using AV mediated gene therapy. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Dwight. It's my uh, great pleasure today to present to you um, on the status of the DTX301 trial, which is a uh, phase one, two clinical trial of adeno-associated virus-mediated gene transfer in adults with late-onset ornithine transcarbamylase, or OTC, deficiency. These are my disclosures. I have participated as the lead PI in the development of the clinical trial protocol, and I am now the site PI uh, for the study at uh, OHSU. Uh, although I have screened patients for inclusion in the trial, uh, I, none of the subjects I, I will report on today uh, have been treated at uh, our site. So I'll be presenting data collected at other sites, uh, analyzed uh, by the uh, sponsor study staff and uh, provided to me by the study staff at Ultragenics. So my tasks today uh, include reviewing with you the current status of therapy for late onset OTC deficiency and the unmet uh, uh, treatment need uh, for the sake of this audience, I'm going to skip the AAV gene therapy basics. Uh, but I will describe the DTX301 uh, vector and the rationale for its use. I'll detail the design of the phase 1-2 clinical protocol, which primarily aims to assess the safety of this treatment approach and to explore vector dosing. And then we'll present a bit of preliminary data from the first dosing cohort. OTC deficiency is a rare inborn error metabolism. But late onset disease is actually one of the more common disorders of the urea cycle. So uh, for the non-metabolites in the audience, uh, the prototypical form of OTC deficiency presents as severe neonatal onset disease with hyperaminemia and frequently lethal coma, uh, primarily in male infants. But these children are not the subjects of this trial. So individuals, both males and females, with partial OTC deficiency who have onset of acute hyperaminemic crisis and other symptoms later in life are actually much more prevalent, and they're the target population for this work. So there are over 500 patients with late onset OTC deficiency who are registered in the database of the International Urea Cycle Disorders Consortium, which I'm also part of. And this database includes only patients who are recruited for, with their consent from 16 centers in the United States, Canada, Germany, and Switzerland. So these are you know, underrepresentative of the total worldwide population, just to give you an idea of how prevalent this is in comparison to the uh, uh, more rare severe defects. So the function of the urea cycle is to convert ammonia, which is generated in the course of normal protein metabolism, into urea, into urea, which is then excreted in urine. And in any urea cycle disorder, ammonia accumulation can lead to CNS dysfunction, which is primarily due to brain edema. Uh, in individuals with inherited OTC deficiency, which is there in the big blue box, uh, the condensation of carbamyl phosphate with ornithine to form citrulline is impaired. And synthesis and excretion of the metabolite erotic acid is a consequence of the carbamyl phosphate accumulation. And erotic acid excretion is a diagnostic feature of the proximal urea cycle disorders, including OTC deficiency. For our clinical trial, we're evaluating three biochemical measures of urea cycle function. The accumulation of ammonia in blood over a 24-hour period. The rate of urea production using a stable isotope loading technique. And finally, the urinary erotic acid excretion. Hyperaminemia, here defined as serum ammonia greater than 100 micromolar, is associated with significant morbidity and mortality, primarily due to consequences of brain edema. And individuals with partial OTC deficiency tend to suffer recurrent episodes of hyperaminemic crisis. With each crisis, there's a significant risk of mortality that can be, be up to 10% with each episode. 
The current standard of care does not directly correct urea cycle function, but rather helps to mitigate the production and accumulation of ammonia. To help reduce production of ammonia, we restrict the dietary intake of protein. And in order to do that safely, we supplement with essential amino acids, uh, vitamins, and trace elements in, in this very specialized diet. And we utilize specific nitrogen scavenger medications. And these conjugate ammonia generating amino acids and turn them into substances that can be readily excreted in urine. Liver transplant is a treatment for all of the urea cycle disorders. And while transplant can, can eliminate the risk of hyperammonemic crisis, patients may remain on immunosuppressants for life, yet they face a continuous risk for persistent, uh, or a persistent risk for organ rejection. Even well-controlled patients in terms of their dietary and medical management are at continuous significant risk for morbidity and mortality during hyperammonemic crisis. Anything that causes a significant catabolic stress can cause protein breakdown and the subsequent production of ammonia. Many of these crises are triggered by infection, but anything that causes prolonged fasting, including surgery or other critical illness, can trigger a hyperammonemic crisis. In addition, we have chronic compliance problems with the contemporary therapy. Diet is not very tolerable. It's very difficult to maintain. Treatment with certain scavenger medications requires a large number of pills to be taken orally every day. There's a significant amount of gastric distress that goes along with taking these pills, and some individuals have significant problems maintaining compliance with the scavenger medications. So you can see that there's a significant need for better therapy for OTC deficiency. DTX301 is a gene therapy vector that's designed to express human OTC activity in liver. And OTC gene transfer mediated by DTX301 has several potential therapeutic advantages over contemporary therapy. Gene therapy offers the potential to directly address the biological deficiency by restoring the enzymatic activity in the liver. We predict that this will be a long-term durable response that will allow loosening of the dietary restrictions, decrease the need for the chronic scavenger medication use, therefore eliminate non-compliance issues and ultimately improve their quality of life. The experimental product, DTX301, is a self-complementary adeno-associated virus serotype 8 vector. It encodes a codon-optimized human wild-type OTC gene under expression control from a liver-specific promoter and enhancer combination. Vector has been produced in HEK293 cells using, sorry, using a standard production system under GMP conditions. DTX301 is administered to trial subjects by a single peripheral intravenous infusion. The rationale for the use of DTX301 in the treatment of OTC deficiency is based upon preclinical experiments carried out in male sparse for ash mice, which is a model of partial human OTC deficiency. Vector was originally designed and produced for preclinical experiments by Lily Wong and others in Jim Wilson's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. The treatment of sparse for ash mice was carried out with the assistance of Hiroki Morizono and colleagues in Mark Batshaw's lab. And in this experiment, the OTC-expressing AAV vector was administered at increasing doses via the tail vein injection in male sparse for ash mice. At euthanasia, both the liver OTC activity, which in this graph is depicted in the open circles, and the amount of liver vector genomes, which is in, the to uh, in total liver DNA, which is here in the black, uh, are, are directly related to the dose of the vector that was given. As you can see, keep going here. And uh, this dose related increase in liver OTC activity is also apparent histochemically. 50, 50 to 60 percent of the uh, hepatocytes were transduced as measured by either histochemical staining for OTC activity or by immunohistology to detect the OTC protein. Sparse for ash mice are not hyperammonemic while consuming normal mouse chow. So for this study, reduction in urinary erotic acid excretion was used as the efficacy measure. So as you can see that after DTX301 treatment, uh, substantial dose-related reduction in urinary erotic acid by seven days occurred. And from this data, the minimum effective dose in the mouse was found to be about 1 times 10 to the 11th vector genomes per kilo of body weight. So precise relationship between the minimum effective dose in mice and humans is unknown, 
but it's estimated that the minimum effective dose in humans is approximately 10 to 40 times greater. So we estimated that the MED for humans would be between 1 times 10 to the 12th and uh, 4 times 10 to the 12th GC per kilo of body weight. So now to the specifics of the study protocol. The DTX301 trial is a phase 1-2 open-label multi-center trial that's designed to primarily study the safety and the tolerability of uh, uh, this treatment approach and to explore dosing of the DTX301 vector. The three different doses proposed are the doses that were, uh, that were doses chosen based on the preclinical data that I just discussed. Our study population is adults with late onset OTC deficiency of either sex. Three subjects have entered and completed dosing in the first dose cohort, and we have safety and some efficacy data on this first cohort to present today. The data monitoring committee met in early March and finding no significant safety signals gave permission to enroll the next dose cohort. Current study is 52 weeks in duration, uh, but subjects will be asked to enroll in a four-year extension trial to monitor the long-term safety and efficacy. Patients determined to be study eligible through screening are admitted for a 48-hour inpatient stay. Day zero includes a series of baseline evaluations, and on days one, subjects receive a single peripheral IV infusion of DTX-301. They're monitored for any adverse effects for an additional 24 hours. For the first 12 weeks, blood samples are obtained every four days to assess safety signals. Thereafter, patients are evaluated every two to four weeks out to a total study duration of 52 weeks. Study period includes both inpatient and outpatient assessments. The end of the 52-week study or at early withdrawal, patients receive a final inpatient admission. We'll strongly recommend that patients enroll in the long-term extension study, which is designed to evaluate safety for an additional four years. The key eligibility criteria for the study are that subjects be adults with late onset OTC deficiency who have had at least a single symptomatic hyperammonemic event with a blood ammonia level of at least 100 micromolar at some point in their life. In general, they need to be on a stable dietary regimen and clinically stable with a stable ammonia scavenger dose. Patients are excluded if their ammonia at baseline is already over 100 or if they've had hyperammonemia signs and symptoms during the four weeks prior to screening. Also, any individuals that have evidence of active liver infection or inflammation are excluded. Subjects cannot exhibit pre-existing antibodies against AAV8. To date, this has been a frequent cause of exclusion as about half of the potential subjects screened have exhibited anti-AV8 antibodies in circulation at screening. These are our primary and secondary endpoints for the study. The primary endpoint is safety. Our goal is to determine the safety of a single intravenous dose of DTX-301 in adults with late onset OTC deficiency. There are two secondary endpoints related to efficacy. The first is a measured rate of ureogenesis using a stable isotope loading method. Second outcome measure is repetitive measurement of blood ammonia over a 24-hour period and then calculation of the 24-hour area under the ammonia curve. The study includes some exploratory endpoints, including an additional efficacy endpoint, evaluation of immunogenicity, and evaluation of treatment effects upon cognitive function. The exploratory efficacy endpoint is measurement of urinary erotic acid. The immunogenicity endpoint is designed to evaluate the immune response to both the AAV8 capsid proteins as well as to the OTC protein. Finally, we have incorporated instruments that measure the response of specific cognitive function as well as effects upon quality of life. These are our study safety stopping criteria. Enrollment will be suspended at any time during the study if any of the following occur. There is the death of a subject, if there is at least a grade three toxicity that uh, develops related to infusion that excludes hyperammonemic events, which can be a normal consequence of their disorder, occurrence of a malignancy at any point after administration of DTX-301 is a, a final exclusion or a final stopping criteria. So turning now to the uh, preliminary data available on the first cohort. Subject one, uh, a male received DTX-301 infusion on August 31st, 2017 at an institution in the UK. As of the most recent data cut, subject one had completed 24 weeks of the trial. Subject two, a female, and subject three, another male, had reached 20 and 12 weeks post-DTX-301 infusion, respectively. To date, there have been no immediate post-infusion adverse events and no severe adverse events at any time. 
All adverse events have been mild in severity and have resolved. Most have been deemed unrelated to DTX-301 exposure. The exception is a transient asymptomatic elevation in serum alanine aminotransferase, or ALT, occurring in two subjects that is likely related to DTX-301 treatment. This adverse event, of course, was expected as it has occurred in clinical trials with AAV for other diseases. As displayed here in the blue lines and on the left axis, left y-axis, subjects two and three both exhibited about 60% of the normal ureogenesis rate as measured by the stable isotope loading technique at pretreatment baseline, and neither have exhibited any significant change over time in measured ureogenesis post-treatment at the lowest dose. Serum ALT in green did increase above the upper limit of the normal range, which is the normal range depicted here in the gray line. This increase happened in subject two at day 36 post-infusion, but there was no increase in subject three. Because the onset of ALT elevation has been associated with reduction in the amount of circulating coagulation factor in AAV gene therapy trials for hemophilia, and therefore possible loss of efficacy, the site PI elected to treat subject two with oral prednisone burst and taper to suppress a presumed immune reaction against AAV8 transduced hepatocytes. The doses and duration of oral prednisone are here depicted in purple. The serum ALT in subject two decreased back to the normal range following six weeks of prednisone treatment. Subject one has demonstrated more interesting results. A similar transient mild asymptomatic rise above normal in serum ALT occurred at day 32 post-treatment and was treated uneventfully with oral prednisone. Ureogenesis at baseline measured about 70% of the normal rate and increased 67% by six weeks after DTX-301 treatment. At 12 weeks, his ureogenesis rate had decreased a bit but was still 30% above the pretreatment baseline. At the most recent measurement at 24 weeks, the subject's ureogenesis rate reached about 130% of normal, a 100% increase from the baseline measurement. Because of this significant increase in the measured ureogenesis, the site PI elected to completely withdraw nitrogen scavenger treatment. In summary, our preliminary trial data demonstrate a favorable potential benefit versus risk profile for DTX-301 at the lowest planned dose for the treatment of late onset OTC deficiency. As was expected from prior AAV clinical trials, two of three subjects exhibited mild asymptomatic increases in serum ALT that have responded to prednisone treatment. There have been no severe adverse effects of prednisone therapy. This in itself is an important observation because there's anecdotal lore in the metabolic field warning against the potential lethal consequences of steroid treatment in patients with urea cycle disorders, so we can cross that one off. Uh, the data from the first treated subject provide preliminary evidence for biological activity of DTX-301. Based upon the acceptable safety profile of DTX-301 in the first dose cohort, the DMC has recommended moving forward with enrollment into the next dose cohort, and data from this group are expected or later in the year, this year. So it's been my honor to present to you today on behalf of the sponsor and of the PIs at the DTX-301 study sites in the U.S., Canada, England, and Spain. And I personally feel very privileged to have participated in the development and the execution of what I think is a very important program. And furthermore, I want to um, thank the site PIs and especially the patients uh, for their enthusiasm and for their trust in, the, in this project. And uh, I thank you for listening. Any, any questions, please come to the microphone. Uh, while, while they're doing that, Carrie, uh, I, I've seen firsthand a patient decompensate after a hydrocortisone shot. Do you, do you think that the uh, concern about giving steroids in these patients is really mm, unwarranted? No, I think we have to be careful. And, and I'm not thinking we need to be cavalier, but we had huge discussions at the PI meetings. Yeah. And I, for one, voted, we didn't vote. <laughs> we ended up deciding that um, steroid treatment would be not required in the protocol, but would be a discussion between the medical monitors of the sponsor and the site PI. And although everyone um, realized that this was kind of a one-shot deal and they didn't want to lose efficacy, the other side of this was it is an experiment and if there was huge risk to doing steroids, did we want to go that route? 
either. My personal experience with steroids you know, in the past has been if someone has been decompensating and they've gotten steroids, that that could potentially be a problem. But I've used steroids in someone who was, you know, otherwise healthy, so got steroids for, um, you know, an asthma attack or something and did okay if we watched them carefully. So I think it entirely depended upon the clinical status that they were in. And the protocol is written so that we could hospitalize them and potentially put an IV in and try to keep them anabolic if we were going to use steroids. I don't think that was done in either case. I wasn't, they're not my patients, obviously, but as, from what I know from the PIs that treated those patients, they were, they were given oral steroids and just monitored carefully, and they, and they did fine. So I'm not saying to do this cavalierly. We still need to be careful, but I don't think it's an absolute exclusion just because they have a urea cycle, which is the way I was trained. Yeah. Hi, Scott McKay from Minnesota. Scott. Um, that's very encouraging data at the lowest dose that you're seeing. So yeah, would you, I mean, would you, you know, it's would one you out like, of three, would you like, keep moving. Yeah, would you like to discuss the prospect of treating children? I would love to treat children. Um, I mean, obviously this is AV8, it's epizomal. Um, I, it, we discussed early on, I was never part of the direct negotiations with the FDA. I, mean, we, we, I had had academic discussions with people about using this type of drug as a transient rescue type of thing, but it would probably not be permanent, right, in a, in a neonate with, uh, because of the rapid turnover and loss of episomes. So I think a permanent treatment using this would need something that would be more integrated would be my personal thought, whether it would rescue them from coma and then allow us to get to something more permanent is a question I still think would need to be investigated. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to that if we could show that this was relatively safe. Um, at some point, we might go there. Hi, uh, Jean-Philippe Combal, Vivet Therapeutics. I have a question regarding the total VG you injected to the three different patients, and did you try to correlate to the volume of the liver or size of the liver to observe so big differences? No, so, I don't know, Sam in the audience. Um, <laughs> Um, I can ask Sam. So you want I that. think the, I mean, the calculations were, you know, again, okay. we could spend a day probably discussing how you go from from mice to humans and deciding based on how everybody makes virus and how you do your titers what the best dose should be. But that's why we do dose finding, right? Okay. And I can absolutely imagine that the same dose in ten people will react completely differently for for a variety of dozens of reasons that we don't yet understand, right? So this is why we have to do a variety of doses and it's a learning experience, is my personal opinion, without being a vectorologist. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in your inclusion criteria, you, you set uh, the cutoff for uh, neutralizing antibodies at less than one to five. Um, in, the, in the patients that were enrolled, there were uh, uh, they were all the same, all negative, all, uh, uh, do you have any more, uh, let's say, granularity around the titers that were at inclusion? I don't know the full range of ones that were positive. So no. the ones that were treated were undetectable, but I don't know what the sensitivity of the assay was. It was, I suppose, less than one to five was the cutoff. That probably was the sensitivity, if it was either over one to five or under one to five, right? And this was a neutralizing assay, functional? Okay. Yes. Okay. It was a neutralizing antibody assay. We have another question. Hi, uh, Chet Whitley, Minneapolis. Uh, Sick Harry, wonderful work, and I think it's tremendous that someone who has a foot firmly planted in the basic science and the animal work can then be a direct part of the, the clinical studies. And I'm thinking about the issue of minimal effective dose. I think, frankly, right now, we have too many therapies that are minimally effective. <laughs> As a consequence, <laughs> yeah. have you thought about how you're going to use biomarkers or other indications or other methods such as you're using now when you get toward an actual approved drug and if it will be minimally effective or how you're going to figure out what dose is ultimately good for clinical use? Well, to me, this... First off, this is my opinion. 
not the sponsors. Um, uh, I think we're a little bit of a conundrum with this particular trial. And this stems from historical reasons. We, for those reasons, are treating the Goldilocks patients, right? We, we are treating patients that are, have been sick, so it's worth taking the risk. They're not, it's not the asymptomatic female carriers that we know have a potential for being sick, but they never have been but they're not so sick that we think that they're at high risk for giving a safety signal, so that's this sweet spot. But as you can see, and no one's asked this, but their ureogenesis rates are surprisingly high. At least they were surprisingly high to me. So that doesn't give you a lot of room to see a therapeutic signal, right? And I haven't seen the data, but you know we're doing the 24-hour area ammonia under the curve, and I'm gonna, I, I will guess that they're not very abnormal at baseline because their ureogenesis is pretty normal. And I think we're gonna need to look at patients that are more severe, that have lower ureogenesis rates, that have more abnormal biochemistry before we can figure out what true dose we need to make a big shift in that. Is my, is my gut feeling on this, or to be able to take a, a, a disease that has not such a lethal consequence, but a, a better range of biomarker, if you will, that we can then do maybe a little more effective relationship between dose and biomarker without the potential lethal consequence to either trial subject or the trial. <laughs> is my opinion. Okay, I think, thank you very much. Thank you. So.